Hello, my name is Joe Segas. I'm a PhD student here in the Department of Forest Biomaterials at NC State University. And today I get the pleasure of talking about the different bioproducts that this course will focus on. So I'm going to start off with a few learning objectives. First is uh, hopefully we will, as I just mentioned, develop a general understanding of the different bioproducts that will be covered in this course. And then in addition to that, develop an appreciation for the potential that the biomass resources have for the production of valued products and also the environmental benefits that come with those products. And lastly, just to develop a general understanding of the demand and supply of the different bioproducts. So I think it's important to start off by defining what we mean when we say bioproduct. So in this course, we will typically refer to any useful product made from a biorenewable resource. Uh, and we'll talk about five different uh, bioproducts. And in the next lecture, we're going to dive into these uh, a bit further than this lecture. This one is more of just an introductory course. So first is biopower. You can think of biopower as basically converting the chemical energy in biomass into um, stationary power or electricity. So um, burning wood to produce heat, harnessing that heat to make power, that's a form of biopower. Um, and there's two different fuels that are typically used to make biopower, solid fuels such as pellets, charcoal, and municipal solid waste, and then there's gaseous fu uh, fuels such as methane, um, which is made from livestock waste typically, um, and hydrogen. Biofuels, when we talk about biofuels in this course, we will be talking about liquid fuels derived from biomass. Um, common examples are bioethanol and biodiesel. Those are the two uh, largest produced biofuels in the US. And then also biojet fuel, which is kind of an emerging biofuel. Wood products, these are probably the most common bioproducts that we interact with on a daily basis. They include building materials, furniture, and you know, flooring, things like that. Paper products, these are a really big deal in the state of North Carolina and also here at NC State University. Um, they include print and writing paper, container boards, such as you know, cardboard, and then many different uh, valuable tissue products. Last, we have sort of lumped a bunch of different exciting, or at least what we think are exciting, more cutting edge bioproducts in what we term advanced products. Um, and we're gonna go into each of these um, in a bit, but they include bioplastics, fibers, food additives, pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, adhesives and coatings, and composites. Okay, so we think it's pretty important to talk about some of the bioproducts that will not be covered in this course. Um, so most people don't really think of agricultural products as bioproducts, but they technically are. They fall under the umbrella of the bioeconomy. They include fruits, vegetables, um, sugars, things like that. Um, another bioproduct we won't be touching on too much are uh, food processing bioproducts. So basically the downstream product of um, processing of different agricultural products. So milk, cheese, yogurt, bread, things like that. All right, so to make these different bioproducts, they have to be converted. Um, they have to or refined from their initial biomass feedstock. And that's what we are going to term biorefining. So starting with a biomass source, it goes through some sort of biorefining conversion process. And then from that, you can get various different bioproducts, such as you know, biopower, biofuels, all the ones I just talked about, wood products, paper products, and then advanced products. Um, one thing to note with the advanced products, that image there is a Coca-Cola plant bottle. And that is what Dr. Venditti showed uh, in the very first lecture because uh, it's a really exciting advanced bioproduct because the plastic is partially made from sustainable bio-based materials. Okay, so I want you all to take a second and work with me on this one. There are four different bioproducts shown and I want you to think just for a second how each of these are classified as bioproducts. What biomass resource was used to make these products? So the first one's pretty obvious, um, it's on, the, on your left, it's basically just a wooden deck, right? So it uses wood, uh, which is a bioproduct, and wood is used in many buildings, um, and in a lot of homes in particular. The second one is also pretty obvious, it's a paper towel, so uh, paper, which is, comes from uh, wood fiber, was used to make the towels. 
The next one is not so obvious, but I was hoping you would pick up on the ethanol part because 10% or more of all the gasoline that is produced uh, and consumed in the United States is ethanol, which is a bioproduct. It's made from primarily cornstarch, a fermentation of cornstarch. Um, and ethanol is included in gasoline for multiple reasons. Uh, one, it's an oxygenate, it, it, it results in a cleaner burning fuel. Um, it reduces the amount of oil that's necessary, right? So that's a lot of environmental and political benefits there. And we're gonna talk about all this later. Um, but it's just uh, important to realize that every time you go fill up your car, you are putting a byproduct into your gas tank. Oh, sorry. Lastly, um, this one's not, not so obvious, but LCD screens, which are in most cell phones, um, a lot of them have a film on them, a coating. And that coating is oftentimes made of cellulose acetate, uh, which is kind of a plastic-like material derived from wood, wood fibers. All right, now I'm going to go into the different feedstocks used for uh, bioproducts. So these are the different types of biomass that are commonly used to make bioproducts. So we have sustainable crops, um, which can be corn or sorghum, or you can add even more sustainable crops like uh, miscanthus and switchgrass, which have a lot of environmental benefits and are being looked at extensively right now in research. Next, we have sustainable trees. Uh, the southeastern U.S. Uh, in particular, where North Carolina is located, obviously, has you know vast forest uh, lands and um, a lot of sustainable tree plantations that are maintained, really for the sole purpose of eventually selling the the wood to make different bioproducts. Um, you know, the uh, the southeast of the U.S. is actually referred to as uh, the timber basket of the world by some people. Next we have algae, particularly microalgae. This is sort of an emerging feedstock, a really exciting one, because uh, it's very sustainable. It doesn't require much land. You can use seawater, salt water, so a lot of interest in using algae to make bioproducts. Next is livestock waste, which uh, is another really sustainable one because you know what are you going to do with all of this waste coming from your different livestock? Well, scientists and, and engineers have designed technologies to one of the most common technologies is to make biogas from which you can make biopower which is pretty cool next we have industrial residues these commonly are mainly referred to biomass residues from agro-industrial plants processes so for instance um, sugarcane which there's a big industry in florida and louisiana and obviously in south america um, after the sugar is purified from the sugar cane you're left with the gas which is this woody waste material that is commonly just burnt for biopower, but some more advanced, higher value products are, are under development using materials like that. Next, we have agricultural residues. You can think of this as the material that's left on the field after a crop has been harvested. So corn, for instance, after all the corn is harvested, the stover, so the, the leaves, the stalks, a lot of that is left on the soil. And some of it needs to stay in the soil for environmental reasons, but some of it can actually be taken off of the, the soil uh, and used for uh, bioproducts. Next, in a similar fashion, we have forest residues. So after the trees are harvested, you're also left with a lot of material that can be extracted and used for bioproducts. Lastly, we have municipal solid waste. Uh, so this is basically the garbage that you generate at home, um, but more so the organics that are within the garbage. So the food waste, some of the paper waste, um, you know, um, mainly the organic fractions. All right, moving on. So the United States has a huge potential for building the bioeconomy. Of all the different countries, the U.S. is positioned for success, we, we think. Um, and the Department of Energy has put a lot of time and effort into sort of um, showing this potential to the public, and they've done what they call the billion ton study, which was uh, many scientists, many professionals uh, looked into finding how much biomass can the U.S. generate in a sustainable, eco-friendly way without impacting land for food and without consuming too much water or fertilizer. And they came up with a billion dry tons per year. And that turns out to have a lot of benefits. So you can see you know, 1.5 million jobs. Um, 8 million homes could be powered from this biomass. 30% of all the transportation fuels could be substituted, so that's you know, taking away our dependence on, on oil, foreign oil. 
a lot of uh, you know, billions and billions of pounds of bio-based chemicals and products. And then also really uh, importantly is the reduction in greenhouse gases that can, that can come from using bioproducts. All right, um, one sort of common theme to having a successful bioeconomy is the ability to convert low value biomass to high value products in a cost effective and non-polluting manner. Um, so bioproducts follow similar economics as do all the other products in the economy. Uh, free market where supply will increase to meet demand. And the demand is increasing, one, because the costs are dropping for bioproducts, and two, because people are becoming more environmentally conscious and, when, and, and want to choose products that have a lesser impact on the environment. Um, but some, some uh, bioproducts don't follow the traditional free market economics. They actually have government help, um, mandates and subsidies. Um, you know, the U.S., for instance, has mandates to use ethanol. Um, and that was really put in place, um, you know, to, for environmental and socio-political reasons, but also to, to get the newer technologies off the ground because they're a bit risky in the beginning. Um, and also a, a policy that was put in place in Italy recently uh, is mandating the use of biodegradable bla uh, bags, uh, which is pretty, pretty interesting. Okay, so here's an example of following that you know, low value biomass to high value byproduct. Starting with uh, a tree, a pine tree in this case, which is about, cost about $80 per ton, can be converted into a fiber, a cellulose pulp, which costs about $800 per ton. So that's a tenfold increase in, in value. And that's what you know, the bioeconomy uh, really needs to, to focus on to, to make it successful and, and less risky. All right, so I want you to think again here with me for just a second. We got two different products. We have a BMW, and then we have, think of like the nicest tissues you can buy at the supermarket. Which one of these two products costs more on a weight basis? So per you know pound of product, which one has more value? It's pretty obvious that I wouldn't include the slide unless there was something surprising. So yes, the tissue product costs more per unit weight than uh, BMW, which is Pretty exciting stuff. So literally, money can grow on trees. All right, so this slide, I know, I'm sorry, there's a lot going on, there's some chemistry, some funky materials. I just want to convey that lignocellulose, you're gonna hear the word cellulose a lot, and maybe lignocellulose throughout this course. It's a very low cost form of biomass and a very sustainable form of biomass. Um, and there's a lot of the different biomass feedstocks I went over earlier contain lignocellulose. So trees, for instance, uh, grasses, bushes, um, a lot of the different feedstocks are made of lignocellulose. So just sort of following from the, the top left, you can see zooming in uh, eventually down to the micron scale where you can see the cellular structure. The cell walls of these plants are made of lignocellulose. And the cellulose is what we're most interested in. Uh, it constitutes about 50% of the mass of these cell walls. Um, and it, it, it gives the plants and the trees their really um, strong structure, their rigidity. Um, and that's what can be extracted and used to make really valuable products. So just keep that in mind. When you hear cellulose, it's the fibers within these different biomass feedstocks that are so valuable. Okay, two more slides, then I'm done. Um, this one is talking about the United States Renewable Fuel Standard. And this was one of those governmental policies that was put in place in 2005. Uh, under the Energy Policy Act. And the main idea was to sort of require the use of renewable fuels in the United States. And the Environmental Protection Agency is the one that oversees this uh, policy. And they're constantly trying to, to change it and make it to where it's more successful. And it has had success, don't get me wrong. Um, you can see the initial idea was to slowly ramp up the amount of renewable fuels used in the United States over, um, I think about like a 14 year time period uh, from 2006 to 2022, um, so 16 years. And uh, you can see the green bottom part plateaus for the renewable fuels around you know 2012 or so, it's kind of flattens out and then the idea was to start bringing in more advanced biofuels. And there's a little bit of a struggle, but um, the mandate is working and uh, the EPA is trying to, to make it work better. So now I want to quickly talk about Brazil's ethanol program uh, because Brazil and the United States are the biggest producers of biofuels. Um, and Pro Alcool program, which was developed in 1975, 
to promote, uh, promote the use of sugarcane ethanol uh, was a huge success, uh, mainly because sugarcane is grown very easily in Brazil. And nearly all of the vehicles in Brazil are flux fuel, and they can run on entirely ethanol or entirely gasoline, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and the sugarcane ethanol has replaced more than 40% of Brazil's gasoline demand. So, just quickly summarizing this lecture, we defined what a bioproduct is, we stated the different feedstocks used to make the bioproducts, we explained some of the impacts, uh, and then went over some of the economic motivation, and then finally provide, provided some examples of domestic and international uh, policies to encourage the use of bioproducts. So, thanks for listening.